three this time uh, wouldn't be success in your term. You'd want to expand the number uh, closer to how you performed at the 2010 election. Well, actually, uh, the benchmark for success for the Greens is holding our sitting members. Of course, we want to um, increase the numbers, as any political party does. But we're in a very different uh, political climate than we were in 2010. Uh, the tide was really coming in on support for action on climate change, for example, in 2010. There were people really disappointed with how the Rudd government had uh, backflipped on climate change. People were disgusted with uh, Julia Gillard's cave into the mining industry and so on. So there was a different context. Um, now the tide is coming in for the Conservatives around the country and it's really important that we hold our seats, especially in South Australia and Western Australia. Of course, we, we're campaigning for Peter in Tasmania, but those two seats, if they're not won by the Greens, will be won by the Liberals. And that means that Tony Abbott then will aff have effective control of the Senate. Can, can and that's why we desperately need to hold the Greens in, in, in uh, those seats. Can I ask you just about, you, you say that the tide is now coming in for the Conservative side of politics. That's despite over two years of the Greens and the Labor Party uh, having a lot of negative things to say uh, about Tony Abbott and what he may or may not do were he to become Prime Minister. How do you explain that? How do you explain that the tide, as you say, is coming in for the Conservatives since having had two years of Labor government, including in alliance for much of that time with the Greens? Well, a lot of it is that there hasn't really been much scrutiny on Tony Abbott and what he would actually do, because unfortunately, Labor has imploded from within and has made itself the story uh, for really the last couple of years. The Labor leadership has never really gone away. Uh, and as a result, that's always the story. And Tony Abbott has never had to answer for what he would actually do, where he would get the money from, what is he going to do about education funding? Is he going to maintain the old unfair system? I believe that is exactly what he would do. He will advantage the rich, he will disadvantage the poor in Australia, and he will be a shocker for the Australian economy because he's going to take us back to the old fossil fuel age. But until you actually get him on these programs and actually say, what are you going to do? Where is the money going to come from? He can make himself it, a small target and ride like, his bike around the country. It sounds like once elected, you think that, uh, it, it, well, you would hope by the sounds of it that it happens before then, but it sounds like at the very least, once elected Prime Minister, you think that uh, any support that the Liberals pick up at the next election will fade fairly quickly when the scrutiny becomes stronger, as it always does on an incumbent. Well, that's exactly what's happened with Campbell Newman in Queensland. It's, it feels very much like that to me. Uh, I was in Queensland before the state election. It was the same situation. Everyone was keen for a change. They got the change and then they suddenly realised this was a disaster for Although Queensland. Although the last poll saw his numbers go back up. Yes, but you walk around Queensland and talk to people and they're shaking their heads because they can see the destruction of the Great Barrier Reef, for example, the coal ports, his attitude to the flood levy, for example. He opposed it the first time round after the floods and then suddenly had his hand out afterwards saying the Commonwealth should pay after having said Queensland's open for the coal business. You know. As soon as they get scrutiny, you find that the wheels fall off very quickly and that's what will happen with Tony Abbott. We had this announcement uh, the other day, yesterday, that uh, WikiLeaks and Julian Assange will be candidates for the Senate at the next election. Uh, one imagines that they will take votes away from the Greens. What's your response to this? Oh, we welcome uh, any number of parties running in the election, and we always have. We want to get beyond a two-party system in Australia, obviously, uh, and we think the Greens can uh, win in uh, Victoria. We'll be working. That's where predominantly the WikiLeaks campaign will be run. And we believe, we're, and we've been one of the strongest supporters, of course, of, uh, of bringing Julian Assange home. But uh, they're a single-issue party. We are a much broader based party and we will work in the election to win that seat but we welcome another player in the election campaign. We saw this week in response to questions Julie Gillard raised the issue of sexism. I'd like to ask you as a female political leader, uh, to what extent do you think, if any, uh, Julie Gillard suffers on the basis of misogyny and sexism? Oh, she does, and we all do. Women in politics generally do, uh, and we, we always recognise that you have to, uh, in many ways, work a lot harder, A, to get there in the first place, and then when you're there, to stand up against it. And you only have to look at the comments that are made. They're always personal. Uh, they they uh, Then there's a policy issue maybe added on after that. 
but yes, she suffers from a lot of sexist um, criticism and women across politics generally do. But John Howard used to suffer some pretty strong personal criticisms. He was called a fascist. Uh, I mean, is it really any worse for Julia Gillard? And, and, and as a follow-up question to that, can I ask, even if there are pockets of sexism that female leaders have to face, do you think that the Prime Minister has got to a point where she started to use the badge of misogyny as a bit of a crutch and in a sense is demeaning the importance of, of fighting it when it does happen to use it as a political weapon where it doesn't necessarily happen? Uh, well, certainly I think it is an issue in Australian politics and I'm glad that she's named it as such. However, having said that, at the time of the misogyny speech in the House of Reps, I did point out that it was on the same day as they were abolishing support for single parents, 80% of whom are women. And I've said at the time that, you know, to be an advocate for women's rights, you not only have to be a, a woman and a role model for being such, but you actually have to advocate the policies that advance women and women's rights. And so on that day, there was certainly um, the, the power of the speech for me was undermined by the fact that a, a very important policy position undermining women was going through the parliament. Christine Milne, Greens leader, we really appreciate you joining us on the Australian Agenda. Thanks very much Thank for your